A prominent English theologian and philosopher named Austin Farrar once made this important observation. Though argument does not create conviction, lack of it destroys belief. What seems to be proved may not be embraced, but what no one shows the ability to defend will quickly be abandoned. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. As important as secular evidences and reasoning may be in exploring the scriptures, including the Book of Abraham, it is also crucial to keep in mind the limits of human understanding. New evidence, new data, and new scholarly findings may change our understanding of ancient cultures. Scholarly arguments, while certainly important in many respects, must be taken into consideration carefully, since the conclusions drawn may be highly tentative. To me, the great key in dealing with issues in the Book of Abraham is to evaluate how we know things. As someone who is very actively engaged in an academic discipline, I'm, I'm actively an Egyptologist, I'm part of an excavation, I've served on national committees and national organizations, I publish actively, uh, I know the field of Egyptology from an academic viewpoint, and I know that we are always figuring out that things that we used to know or used to think we know are wrong. And it's hard to say what's likely because you never know what somebody's going to turn up. And you never know what's in the back rooms of museums. There are hundreds or actually thousands of unpublished papyri in the back rooms of, of museums that in many cases aren't even known to Egyptologists. Um, I went to one papyrus collection and floor to ceiling, wall to wall boxes. And I were told that these are papyri that have never been looked at. I can't use the history book I used to use because it's out of date. There are too many bad ideas in it and too many wrong facts. Five years from now, the things that we're teaching in our history classes we'll see are wrong. Some of the, the uh, research I'm involved in from my archaeological excavation is going to very clearly show that some things that everyone has taught for a hundred years about pyramids is dead wrong. We are always finding out that the things we've taught in the past are wrong. I have a number of colleagues whom I'm very grateful to who try to dig through this material and try to publish it. But one of them in, in publishing the material as recently as 10 years ago, after several major studies and hundreds of papyri said this amounts to less than 1% of the known material. I have never given a lecture on the Book of Abraham the same way twice because we've always learned something new by the time I give it again a month later. So it's hard to find something in print that is, is up to date. I've published a few articles. I'm working on a book about these very questions about the Book of Abraham. Uh, the problem that I'm dealing with is I'll never be able to be done because it will always be out of date soon thereafter. The situation is, of our understanding is very much different from Joseph Smith's day or from a hundred years ago or even fifty years ago <coughs> when Nibley wrote most of his uh, material on the Book of Abraham uh, some of the best evidence for it hadn't been published yet. Uh, you know, Presumably that's why archaeologists go out and dig is so you can find out something you didn't know before. And if you're going to find out something you didn't know before, then you're going to have to revise what you thought you knew. I spend a lot of time, my time answering questions from people who are honest seekers of truth, who have heard things about the Book of Abraham that, that trouble them. Uh, and I've found over doing this for a long period of time that there are a couple of things that are happening consistently. Number one, it is very difficult to find anything written about the Book of Abraham that has good information. Either for or against, most things that are written by our critics are full of inaccuracies. As more research is done, you have, it opens up different questions. Uh, and for the most part, we're in a much better position now than we ever have been as far as supporting the authenticity of the Book of Abraham. Uh, surprisingly, some of the people who are most vociferous against the Book of Abraham come up with some of the best arguments for it. I know people 
who have lo lost their testimony and fallen away from the church over an Egyptological academic issue that now we've found out actually supported Joseph Smith as opposed to, to making it look like he was wrong. As we've continued to learn, we've found out that the thing that troubled them was just wrong, yet they've still left the church. And I think how foolish that is to value what we learn in school when we know much of that is wrong, to value that more highly than to value what we learn from God, which we know is consistently and always infallibly wrong. That is very foolish. And so I think we should be very careful in how we determine the, the relative value of our sources of learning and always remember things learned from God are much more reliable than things learned from our finite minds. I think the strongest evidence for the Book of Abraham is probably its English text. Um, a, a lot of the arguments over the Book of Abraham have focused over the Egyptian materials and uh, their uh, defenders of the faith are, are a little bit at a disadvantage because there's a lot there that we don't quite understand. We're still trying to learn. Uh, there are high barriers to, to dealing with that material effectively because ideally to deal with it effectively you need to learn, you know, Egyptian and, and, uh, and other ancient languages and, and very few people uh, have, have managed to do that. My caution to members of the church and those who are members of the church but are genuinely interested in this is to be very careful about believing what you read because 99.9% .9 of it is wrong. They just have too many wrong things in them and too many bad assumptions. There are only a few people who really know both the historical and the Egyptological sides of the issue. That's where you should go uh, to get your information. Latter-day Saints are given important counsel from the Lord in Doctrine and Covenants section 88 verse 118 when it is revealed and as all have not faith seek ye diligently and teach one another the words of wisdom yea seek ye out of the best books words of wisdom seek learning even by study and also by faith thus our faith should be complemented but not replaced by secular evidences and any rational arguments or evidences we put forth must also be tempered by our faith that is given through a witness of the Holy Ghost. Both faith and reason are important in arriving at the truth. The recovery of the Joseph Smith papyri in 1967 revealed some startling new information about the papyri. First, it was discovered that a large gap, or lacunae, was present in the original illustration to facsimile one. Critics contend that Joseph Smith inaccurately filled in this gap with inappropriate drawings. Instead of the head of a bald priest, they contend a figure at the end of the lion couch should have had the head of a jackal. And instead of a figure with two arms raised up in the air, critics contend there should be a second bird hovering above the lion couch. When we examine uh, this facsimile, first of all, we find that there really isn't another one like it. It's, it seems to be unique. And evidence, especially some of the most recent evidence, suggests that it really is uh, a fingertips rather than a wingtip that, uh, that critics claim was another uh, hawk. And it actually is a second arm by Abraham that's raised in attitude of prayer. But as far as the bald head of the priest, the critics claim, well, okay, th this priest would have been uh, a symbol of Anubis, Egyptian god, and it would have the head of a, of a jackal. Well, we know that in the Ptolemaic period that the priests many times shaved their heads and that they were bald and uh, they wore many times uh, jackal masks, but th they were still bald priests, uh, you know, in performing the rituals. So Joseph Smith got it right as far as the bald priest. Joseph Smith got it right as far as the uh, fingers instead of wingtips. Some of the interesting things about facsimile one are, is how different it is from anything else. I'm not aware of any where they have two hands up. Some people will argue that these are reconstructions, that it shouldn't really be two hands. Recently, a good Egyptologist has looked at it and said, and, and looked at all the parallels he can find and said, no, these are two hands. Some people have argued they're wings or something like that. He's agreed with us. These are two hands. They're up like that, this. That's different. That denotes some kind of struggle or some kind of movement going on. We have... Uh... Uh, several examples of, of uh, 
inscriptions on walls or illustrations on walls of temples that show an Egyptian priest with a jackal-headed mask over his head. And, and it's done such that uh, it, it, it's, you know, it's kind of like an x-ray view where uh, they, they've shown it so that you can see the priest's head inside with this jackal-headed mask over the top of it. And there are also archaeologists have discovered some of those actual masks. As Professor John Gee of Brigham Young University wrote in an important scholarly study that, among other things, showed evidence for Egyptian priests wearing anabus masks, the priest acts in the place of God. This may be done in various ways, such as placing a mask of the God on his head or by simply declaring himself to be a God. However the restoration is made, the individual shown in facsimile 1 figure 3 is a priest, and the entire question of which head should be on the figure is moot so far as identifying the figure is concerned. The entire debate has been a waste of ink. The question is not whether Joseph Smith's reconstruction of the standing figure in his lion couch vignette is accurate, but rather whether the figure is identified correctly as a priest. It is. It is also argued that the priest should not be holding a knife in his hands as depicted in facsimile 1. Many LDS scholars believe that the scroll was damaged after Joseph translated the vignette and some evidence seems to support this view. One early Latter-day Saint who saw the papyri in 1841, for instance, described them as containing the scene of an altar with a man bound and laid thereon and a priest with a knife in his hand standing at the foot with a dove over the person bound on the altar with several idol gods standing around it. Similarly, Reverend Henry Caswall, who visited Nauvoo in April 1842, had a chance to see some of the Egyptian papyri. Caswall, who was hostile to the saints, described facsimile one as having a man standing by him with a drawn knife. The knife on the original papyrus was not drawn in by Joseph Smith. A photograph of the Joseph Smith papyrus one shows there is no knife that has been drawn. In other words, Facsimile 1 correctly reflects what the Joseph Smith papyrus figure 1 originally contained. Critics also claim that the figure on the lion couch should not have both hands raised in the air and instead of arms a bird should be there. However, this is not a valid argument because bird wings are generally drawn enclosed with a solid line around them while hands are a series of lines to represent the fingers. In the very same facsimile, the illustrator draws the bird, which represents an angel of the Lord with rounded wings. Surely he would have drawn another bird in the same fashion. An interesting point is the hieroglyph for praise or supplicate in the figure of a man in the same position that Abraham is in on the lion couch. This is exactly what Abraham was doing in Abraham 1.15 when he said, I lifted up my voice unto the Lord my God, and the Lord hearkened and heard. According to uh, Joseph Smith, he was, Abraham laying on the couch, he had his arms upraised in attitude of prayer. And there's one hawk floating above him, and then the priest is above him with a knife about to sacrifice him. Well, the, the priest is uh, drawn bald, and uh, according to most Egyptologists that have looked at this, or at least originally, they say that, that Joseph Smith got it wrong that uh, the priest wouldn't have been holding a knife, that uh, um, he would have been in attitude of trying to resurrect Osiris, who was actually laying on the lion couch, and that there would have been two hawks above him. And, and so th that's their claim is Joe Smith got it wrong, but there is uh, some evidence that actually Joe Smith got it right. If we look at the original papyrus uh, in the, uh, among the Joseph Smith papyri, that portion of the papyrus is missing. Uh, what Almost certainly, uh, that, that standing figure had the head of a jackal. Uh, all other uh, illustrations similar to that have a jackal. And, and the, the actual, you know, the skin coloring on that standing figure, dark skin coloring, is that of a jackal, of the jackal god Anubis. Uh, that does not eliminate the, the possibility that it is still a priest. One of them is a, uh, it, it's a large pottery jug uh, shaped like a jackal's head painted black and everything with two little eye holes to look out of you know it must have been incredibly heavy to, to carry that thing around and in, in the the illustration there's one priest behind him kind of holding him and guiding him you know it's like you know with this tunnel vision he couldn't see what he was doing so yes it it, it is represents the god anubis but uh, priests would, in, in their rituals, act as if they were the gods and, and even uh, put on 
uh, masks and so on to act out those parts. And so uh, that, that does not invalidate Joseph Smith's interpretation. Yes, uh, there were some witnesses that talk about seeing the uh, facsimiles, the vignettes that the facsimiles were created from, and they describe them in details pretty much like we have them now, uh, even with the, the restored uh, markings that are on the papyri that we have, or, or the Mount of Papyri. There's also some evidence that uh, they weren't complete. And um, in fact, what they call a lacuna, which is basically a tear that shows up through, uh, especially through one of the vignette, that goes to the lower layers. So it's obviously a tear that had appeared while the scroll was rolled up because it, it tapers on, gets thinner and thinner and narrower. Um, that could have happened with Joseph Smith after Joe Smith got the papyrus, it's possible that it happened before Joe Smith got the papyrus. So, it, yeah, we, we, we don't know for sure. In 1975, Professor Hugh Nibley, an eminent Mormon scholar and linguist, published an important volume entitled The Message of the Joseph Smith Papyri, an Egyptian Endowment. In this book, Professor Nibley argued that the ancient Egyptians understood and practiced an imitation version of the temple endowment practiced by the Latter-day Saints. Since the Mormons believe their temple rites have roots in the ancient world, Professor Nibley reasoned that there may be evidence for this by looking into ancient Egyptian, Jewish, and Christian initiation rituals and temple rites. What he discovered were some amazing parallels that lend credence to the idea that the temple ritual has its roots in antiquity. Nibley noted the pattern set forth in Egyptian temple ritual. Number one, the initiate is washed and anointed to be cleansed from impurity. Two, the initiate receives sacred garments. Three, a dramatic representation of the creation and the garden story, including the tree of life motif. Four, a journey on the path back to the presence of deity and a restoration of heavenly blessings. Five, the requirement of sacrifices and covenants. Six, receiving tokens of recognition. Seven, the ritual embrace. Eight, passing through the veil. And finally, nine, seeing the face of God and becoming deified. The parallels between the Egyptian endowment and earlier Jewish and Christian esoteric rituals were also noted by Professor Nibley. He postulated that one of the factors that led to Joseph Smith's restoring the temple endowment was his work with the Egyptian papyri he received in 1835, which included some of the details outlined by Professor Nibley. In short, the Egyptian papyri and the Book of Abraham were instrumental in guiding Joseph Smith to restore the endowment by revelation. One of the really exciting things that we have found as we've gone through and looked at these uh, texts that are Egyptian religious texts that use biblical characters in them. We find lots of little things here and there, uh, all sorts of, there's stele that where Abraham is substituted for Osiris, uh, various little things, but we have a, a, a huge cache of papyri that are really Egyptian rituals. And in this cache, we find they're, they're using frequently biblical figures. Uh, it's riddled with big, biblical figures. Um, we, we know that the Jews, again, interchange these types of thought patterns and use symbols uh, to represent um, their own Jewish scriptures, even though they were Egyptian symbols, pagan uh, symbols. And uh, so it's, it's uh, something that actually has some strong support. Uh, Abraham is a Jewish substitute for Osiris, which is exactly what he is in uh, facsimiles one and three. That's Osiris that, you know, Egyptians recognize that figure as Osiris, but, uh, you know, Abraham has made a Jewish substitute for Osiris. Which is exactly what we find with the Joe Smith papyrus that Egypt Egyptologists say is Osiris laying on the lion couch. The Jewish in, in, in uh, one twist would say it's Abraham laying on the lion couch, and that makes perfect sense from a Jewish standpoint, and it's exactly what we find in the book of Abraham. So we, uh, we find that they're using these, and as I did an intense study, what they use the most is the name of Jehovah. That's, that's who they use the most, the Jews of the time. Uh, but the top two mortals they use are Abraham and Moses. 
And the way they use them, it becomes very, very clear that they knew both the biblical stories, but they also knew stories beyond the Bible, extra-biblical or non-canonical stories. They had materials that told stories about Abraham that aren't in our current Bible. One example of this is a, a text called the Testament of Abraham. In that text, part of it is a description of the judgment. And this judgment scene is, is clearly based on an Egyptian vignette uh, from chapter 125 of the Book of the Dead. And many people have, have seen this. Uh, there's Osiris sitting on his throne, and there's a depiction of scales. And in the Test of Abraham, Osiris becomes Abel. And uh, we see some of the Egyptian gods becoming angels. So there's this crossover going on. And, and, and you know, like I said, the same thing is found very likely in the, in the Book of Abraham that we have. Uh, so, so this scene is being used uh, to frame this depiction of the judgment in this, in this Jewish text. But it's been adapted to reflect Hebrew uh, characters and sensibilities. So now Osiris is, is described as, as Abel, who is sitting on the throne and conducting the judgment. And these Egyptian gods are now described as angels. Uh, so Dokiel and Piroel, they're given Hebrew names. And so this is the, the kind of thing that was common with the Egyptian Jews using Egyptian iconography, but adapting it to their own purposes. Uh, another example is uh, from Luke. We, we have the, the story of Lazarus and the, and the rich man. In, in, in that story, Lazarus, uh, he's a beggar, he's a poor man, he's eating the crumbs from the rich man's table. And uh, when he dies, he goes to the bosom of Abraham. When uh, Lazarus dies, uh, when the rich man dies, excuse me, he goes to hell and he sees Lazarus in, in the distance there and he's bothered by this and he wants uh, Lazarus to go back and warn his brothers so they don't befall the same fate. Well, most scholars think now that that entire story is based on an earlier Egyptian scene where the character in the story of uh, Abraham was played originally by Osiris. They're both relatively common uh, Egyptian funerary texts. They were included um, with the deceased to help them in the afterlife. Again, it had hymns, sometimes spells, um, a variety of different things to help them move through the afterlife. And, um, the Book of Breathing, uh, it, it comes from the word sensin. It's a translation that supposedly means breathing. It sometimes is called the breathing permit or uh, the sensin text or, or a variety of different names. But uh, um, we don't, we call the papyri that we have the sensin text, but it's not like most sensin texts that we're familiar with, even though there are a number of similarities. So from the fragments that we now uh, own that Joseph Smith had. They represent largely two different kinds of texts. One is the, what we call the Book of Breathings, uh, and the other is the Book of the Dead. Both of these are funerary documents for Egyptians. These are, are typical for their time period, uh, and the idea was that they would contain knowledge and spells that would help the deceased in the afterlife get where they want to go, be protected from evil forces, it's things as simple as this is how I avoid getting bitten by a snake in the afterlife. This is how I avoid having my head chopped off in the afterlife. Sometimes the portions of them are maps to tell you where you get to go and spells that are designed to, to bring you back to life or to help you breathe again. That's part of why we get the idea that it's a book of breathings. Uh, it's it's a, to give you the breath of life again that you may be resurrected and live in the hereafter. Besides parallels to ancient texts, the Book of Abraham also has support in its depiction of a strong Egyptian influence in Abraham's homeland. This evidence also explains how a copy of the Book of Abraham could have ended up in Egypt. One of the stories that intrigues me most is how would they have ended up with stories about Abraham in Egypt? The whole idea of Egyptians being up in Abraham's territory, well, this is now a fairly well supported fact, although it's been within the last 10 years, 10, 15 years, has shown that yes, there were Egyptians up there. 
and we have some archaeological evidence for it. It's a very specific time period uh, during the reigns of Sesostris III and Amenemhet III that you actually find Egyptians up in that area. And then after that time period, uh, they're gone. So there's about a 50-year window uh, when that can occur. Uh, but who would have thunk it 100 years ago? In Thebes, which was the uh, city, modern-day Luxor, where the Book of Abraham had come from, there was a huge uh, Jewish presence at that time. And there was a lot of interchange between symbols. Uh, and we know that the Egyptians borrowed, uh, you know, and, and the Jews borrowed uh, symbols, religious symbols especially. And so it, uh, it's not unusual that the Egyptians or the Jews would have used the symbolism that's involved in the vignettes that we, we find in the, in the Book of Abraham. We know that Ancient Egyptian priests knew something about Abraham and uh, that in the early Ptolemaic period you actually have a Greek writer, Hecateus of Abdera, goes down into Thebes in Egypt, talks with the priests and afterwards writes a book about Abraham. Well that book is lost. What's also interesting is that uh, from some of these Egyptian texts, we know that they had a knowledge of Abraham. In one temple uh, collection of papyri, where there's magical uh, incantations and uh, help for leading people to the afterlife, uh, Abraham is mentioned within these texts, and uh, uh, Jehovah is mentioned in, in the text frequently. So it, it, they borrowed an interchange between each other. It wasn't unusual.